All right, we are all set. John, the floor is yours, my friend. Go for it. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining me tonight. Um, <laughs> let's just jump right in. Uh, maybe if I'm on the right screen. <laughs> all right, hang on a second. There we go. All right, let's do this. So um, this talk <laughs> it's called How Not to Run Your Business. Um, it's a working title. Um, so basically, <clears throat> kind of in a nutshell, what we're going to be talking about tonight are, um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of who I am, uh, and then I, we're going to kind of go over a few lessons that I've learned. Um, I've, I started my business about a year ago, right in the middle of, uh, just over a year ago, like right in the middle of the COVID craziness. <laughs> um, kind of a crazy time to start a business, um, but I've learned a few lessons and thought I'd share here tonight. Um, so uh, the first lesson, or yeah, oh yeah. One big caveat is this is a work in progress. I'm kind of presenting my journey as, um, and some of the pitfalls that I've run into along the way, I'm, you know, by no means, I mean, obviously the name of the title, you know, I'm not presenting this, you know, as some sort of crazy expert or guru on how to run a business. I'm just kind of showing some of the stuff that I learned the hard way and, um, you know, in, in an effort to like help you out if you decide to kind of pursue this as, uh, as an option for, uh, for work. So a little backstory about myself. So um, I'm a designer turned developer. I uh, started my career as a graphic designer about 20 years ago. I've worked in agencies in almost all of my career. Um, There's a couple years kind of when I got started that I was working at. My first uh, design job was screen printing t-shirts at a trophy shop. Um, my, uh, my second design job was uh, working at a newspaper building ads. Um, and then, but then since then I've kind of, been working in and uh, kind of in agencies and now on my own um, ever since. So um, I'm mostly a WordPress developer. When um, when I <laughs> I got my first agency job when I moved out of that uh, that creative services creative services department at the newspaper, uh, uh, I got hired by an ad agency that was owned by the newspaper. Uh, the, the company had two designers that, uh, that worked there. One of them just did print stuff and like branding and, you know, kind of traditional graphic design. And one of them did uh, pretty much all the web development and design. And the guy that did all the web stuff was getting so busy that he said, if you don't hire somebody that can do web stuff, I'm going to quit. <laughs> so I got thrown in and I was like this hybrid of the two. So I'd kind of pick up uh, you know, kind of lend a hand on both sides. Since then, I've, um, you know, kind of left that job and worked for, you know, just um, like a straight web development shop. And then after that, I worked as the web guy um, or like kind of started the web department at a marketing shop. So, um, but I'm mostly WordPress developer. I've been building uh, websites with WordPress for years and years and years. Um, but recently I've, um, you know, the, the WordPress ecosystem is changing a lot and um, there's uh, a lot more tools like React and, and stuff coming into that ecosystem. And I'm also uh, have a, a project that I'll kind of uh, touch on a little bit later where um, I'm starting to do some Express and Node development too. So um, that stuff's been really fun, but it's definitely been a challenge. <laughs> so yeah. All right, so we're going to jump into the um, uh, the first example here. Um, like I said, these are um, what I learned the hard way. <laughs> so example number one is um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, as uh, as developers, you know, project work is great, but a lot of times. Um, especially for me, this is something I've struggled with, like coming out of agencies 
where I didn't have to sell or I didn't have to like find new work. Um, it was easy for me to kind of put my head down and just kind of do my, do my tasks at hand and, and punch out at the end of the day. And there was always a steady stream of new projects coming in. Um, uh, but as a solo um, developer and as a, a consultant, you always have to sort of budget your time between the work that you have and the, um, you know, like looking for what's next. So, um, and then also taking the projects that you have currently working on and, and offering those clients ways to sort of come on as like a monthly recurring client. And so, um, like offering hosting packages or marketing services that you white label or, you know, a variety of other things that you can kind of include as um, options to keep, uh, kind of keep uh, billing your clients monthly or, you know, continuing that relationship. Um, so <clears throat> I had this really great project come in. Um, it was awesome. I was building... Um, uh, building a project uh so i was taking um a bunch of different uh kind of it was like a frankenstein franken frankenstein it it had um uh, like a squarespace sort of marketing site and then there was like a second squarespace site that was you know kind of a sub micro site that linked out from the other one there was uh, a shopify site that kind of linked into or you know connected or linked out from it that um, where they sold all their, you know, sold products and things like that. So this client um, was a really good pro a really good project for me. It was kind of taking that Franken Frankensite and kind of merging it all into a, it's kind of one ecosystem. So we, uh, uh, <clears throat> we were taking everything and converting it into um, like a WordPress site, migrating all the content over uh, setting up WooCommerce to handle the, the shop side of everything. So it was all are under one roof. Um, overall, the project went really well. There was a couple of hiccups, but nothing like super major. And the client was, was really happy. Um, kind of moved the client over into like a monthly retainer. It was, everything was great. We had a really good working relationship. I, you know, was almost like a member of the team. So I, uh, you know, would sit in on weekly meetings, um, multiple weekly meetings. Like I would work, you know, I'd join the marketing team, I'd join the the ads team to, to um, and and support kind of all the work that they were doing. Um, it was a really great wor working relationship, and um, and it was really fun. And the bottom fell out. <clears throat> um, so like over the course of six months or so, the project had sort of gotten to a point where it was like definitely in a more of a maintenance space. Um, another aspect of this company is they had a, a Laravel app that that they had built as like their membership site where they um, they hosted a kind of a, like video courses and and weekly webinars and and things that and so they had like a really solid developer that. Um, had been with them for years building out that side of their business. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but um, so what happened was they, at the end of the year, they sort of evaluated where they were financially. They had um, kind of gotten the Laravel app to a point where they didn't need to continue to tweak it and modify it. They had completely reskinned it. And, and over the last year, they had completely re you know, almost from the ground up, redone the entire thing. And, um, and so what they ended up doing was that they, which I totally um, admire and, and um, you know, it, there was no hard feelings involved, but what they decided to do was keep the guy that had been with them for years um, as their, that was doing all their Laravel development and move him sort of into the role that I was in. Um, and then they had to let me go or, you know, had to not continue my retainer, which, you know, was a giant bummer, uh, you know, where I went wrong in this whole situation was, uh, relying on like one client to be like the biggest chunk of, of my revenue for my business and, and how, 
um, you know, how I paid my bills basically. Um, you know, and when that retainer was canceled, uh, it was pretty devastating. Uh, I had, you know, like I had alluded to or mentioned earlier, I had, you know, kind of put all my eggs in this basket. I was kind of head down working on this stuff. I had a little bit of time, but um, that I could have been doing sales and, and, and looking for additional opportunities, but I had kind of gotten to a point where I was like, oh, this is really good. And I like spending time with my family and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really easy to, um, to find other ways to spend your time outside of your business. Um, but, um, you know, one of the, my biggest takeaways from this is, is figuring out way, like making it a priority within my, my business to, to look for ways to have multiple streams of income into the business, um, such as maintenance plans, hosting plans, um, even uh, digital products that you can offer um, that can kind of uh, offset the uncertainty of that project-based um, sort of, you know, cycle where it's, you know, feast or famine, depending on how many projects you have in, in house at the, at the moment. Um, so uh, the second one, the second lesson that I've learned um, is, uh, you don't always have to say yes. <laughs> um, sometimes it actually turns out that, uh, you should probably say no. Um, there's, uh, there's lots of reasons to take projects on. Um, you know, the, <laughs> the inverse of that is, uh, you know, is most projects have lots of reasons not to take them on as well. Um, one of the things that um, I've learned is that, uh, and I kind of keep learning, um, it, is that you don't always have to uh, take projects just to get money in, or you don't have to, especially, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you don't always have to like say yes to everything, even, um, you know, even projects that, you know, look a little bit, you know, like they might have some issues down the road. So um, I'm going to go over a, a, a project that I probably should have uh, said no to. Um, so out of the blue, just in the nick of time, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, the bank account was getting a little thin and uh, projects were wrapping up and wasn't sure what was, what was next. Um, so, but out of the blue, I, I kind of get this, I get a LinkedIn message from somebody that I'd worked with in the past. We had uh, parted ways pretty amicably. There wasn't any red flags. Um, they knew my skill level and skill set. Uh, I knew what it was like to work with them. Uh, and on top of that, they were, um, they were actually offering me a decent amount of money and a decent, you know, but with that was a decent amount of hours. Um, so it, it was going to be a stretch kind of at first to, you know, I had some stuff that was still um, kind of in the works that I needed to wrap up, but they needed to get me, they needed me to get started right away. Um, so, you know, I kind of weighed the pros and cons and I was like, well, it's gonna, you know, probably suck for a little bit. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna be hard to, you know, I'm gonna be working a, a lot of long hours to kind of fit it in what I have already and, and to kind of take on this project or these, so this this work that that came in um <clears throat> you know it seemed like a a manageable amount of hours but it quickly snowballed into um not a manageable amount of work and hours um especially with everything <laughs> uh life was throwing at me um you know so uh i was you know i kind of went above and beyond of what i should have it was a, a it was a fixed number of hours per month. It, like, like I, I think I jumped in because I was excited about like the, you know, the, the possibility to have my hours covered for at least a, a little while and, um, and not have to worry about that sales process and, and getting new projects in because, you know, this was going to be a steady stream of, of work. Um, yeah. And, uh, 
So, but then I got steamrolled. I should have seen it kind of, I should have seen it coming. <laughs> you know, there was, um, you know, I think part of, part of it, I was kind of kidding myself looking back that I was going to be able to, to manage all these hours, do them effectively, finish what I had on my plate and, um, and still, you know, be dad and husband and all the other stuff that I had going on in my life. Um, so, uh, it quickly, you know, it quickly got way too overwhelming. I was missing deadlines. I was staying up super late to try to meet deadlines and which left me really tired. Um, you know, I, I was unable to, you know, when you're in that space, you can't like when you're overworked like that, you kind of miss like stupid little things that you should have caught. And so like things were going to QA and then coming back to me and it was like the cycle of like, you know, it's just not, a, it's not a really good relationship, working relationship, you know, it's, you know, silly mistakes. Um, turns out clients don't like paying for silly mistakes that you make. Um, so yeah, so pretty much in the end, it all, it, it sucked for all of us. You know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't good for my client. It wasn't good for my family life. It wasn't good for my kids. Um, <laughs> being an out of shape 40 something, uh, pretty, uh, you know, not packing my plate should have been a no brainer, but, uh, but I think I was, you know, I, I was definitely, um, sort of attracted to the, the money, you know, like the money was like a big part of it you know, looking back, it's like, you know, turned out not to be as much money as I thought it was going to be because it didn't, you know, the, the retainer ended up uh, getting canceled and, and, um, you know, we, we both agreed that I sort of bit off more than I could handle and, and we were going to part ways, which, you know, and I probably burned a couple of bridges or two in the process, um, you know, but as much as it stinks, you know, failing sucks for sure, but it's, um, it's what, you know, it's what we do when we fail that kind of defines us. I think sometimes, you know, I could either just chalk it up or I could into whatever or learn from it and, and not make those mistakes again and not, you know, try to learn that lesson to not overcommit myself. So, um, the next lesson that I learned is um, <laughs> I call red flag red flag warning. Um, sometimes you should say no for other reasons. Um, I think one of the hardest lessons for us, um, kind of what I touched on a, a little bit, was um, is taking on projects just for the money. Um, even when like you're meeting with a client and and in your initial calls, like there's just like, you get like a little hint of something that's like, you know, something's not quite right. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, there's just something a little bit off in the conversations. The, I think the, you know, I like to call these, I like to call these, I don't, I don't know where I heard this from, but I, I like to call these clients the grinders, right? It's the clients that, that when you sign up, they, they waste way too much of your available time. They don't trust your opinion as sort of the expert. Um, they, they try to micromanage the process from the beginning to the end. Um, and they want to have their hands in every aspect of the process. Like you, like they ask for iterative, you know, they want to see every screen as you're, you know, designing it out or as you're building it out, they want constant, um, you know, points of contact, which a lot of times isn't a bad thing, but if you're kind of spinning your wheels doing that, you know, a lot of times there's better, better ways of using your time. Um, another, uh, <laughs> another, another red flag is, is when you have those conversations with potential clients that are where they talk about, you know, our last developer was a total schmuck or, um, you know, those are like the, those are the red flags that, that really sort of you need to pay attention to because 
a lot of times, I mean, there's definitely a potential that the person that they had worked with previously may or may not have, you know, done the greatest job, right? Or maybe they didn't have processes in place to, to handle this kind of a, pro, uh, a prospect or client. So, um, so when your prospects are telling you about um, how bad their last guy or, or gal was, um, it's not all, you know, it's not always going to be because of what they did wrong. You know, the, the common denominator between these two projects or that project is going to be the client. Right. So, um, you know, I try to be leery about clients like this because you never know how, you know, you can have the most button up process. You can have, um, you know, think you can handle this project, but, um, in the end, there's always a potential that you're going to be the, um, the person they're talking bad about to their next, uh, their next sucker. <laughs> um, but, uh, I think uh, one of the ways that you can con like sort of um, kind of put some stop gaps in place to, to manage some, like these kinds of clients is make sure that you have really clear guidelines of what you're going to be um, presenting and like what the deliverables are. Um, it's really easy to, to have a wide open, you know, yeah, we're going to build a website, but you know, your idea of a website and, the website that you're going to build for them and their idea of the website that they're going to build, you're going to build for them, or there's probably going to be a really vast difference. Um, you know, I've had <laughs> at agencies that I've worked at in the past, I've had clients come in and, and ask for Amazon, but they have a $1,500 budget, you know, so it's, you know, they want, they want an e-commerce site that'll compete on the Amazon level, but they don't have the money to, to pay for it. And you're like, you know how big Amazon is, right? You know, yeah. So, um, so having ways and mechanisms to sort of manage expectations before they get way out of control, and being very clear up front about sort of what your um, what you're going to produce, whether it's you know five page website or a, a a WordPress driven website with this many you know static pages and this kind of functionality. You know whether it's you know you name it including these plugins and and really spec out exactly what you're going to be doing um that that in my sort of experience has been the best way to sort of if you do take on a client like this th that's the best and only way really to to kind of manage their expectations and and to have a successful project in the end so <clears throat> Yeah, so my fourth project or my fourth lesson, um, don't get stuck holding the bag. <laughs> when the crap hits the fan, what do you do? Um, sometimes uh, you can get yourself into situations that go bad by no fault of your own. Um, don't get stuck holding the bag. I think um, so. Uh, so this project, um, I joined a project last year, towards the end of last year as a front end developer. Um, I was actually initially approached to do the entire project, um, but it was um, it was a lot more. It was it was basically converting an, an access database into a web application, and um, and migrating data over. So it was way heavier from a from a backend standpoint, and a like sort of a develop database development standpoint um, than I was comfortable with, but. Um, the project manager that I was working with um, brought in what seemed to be a pretty solid backend developer. It was a guy that um, had a really impressive uh, resume and he had kind of, you know, on paper had a lot going for him. Um, <laughs> about three months into the project, uh, after a bunch of backend development and API work, um, our backend developer moved and ghosted us on the project. So um, they just stopped returning our calls. Uh, our messages went, you know, went unanswered and I got stuck holding the bag. Um, so um, it's taken, 
it's taken a lot longer and thankfully the client's been somewhat understanding um but so so i'm actually in the process of sort of working on figuring out like how i pick up from what the previous backend developer left us um and uh you know and how to kind of get kind of drag this thing over the finish line um so i'm kind of you know one of the biggest takeaways that i've uh that i've learned in this process even though i'm you know currently stuck holding <laughs> stuck holding the bag um is uh have a plan b so um i think the my kind of takeaway from this whole situation that i've been put in is having a uh, a plan b just in case the project goes a little sideways um you know maybe um you know have some kind of contingency contingency plans just in just in case and um if you know if you can't find a like if you're not comfortable with sort of the the uh the emergency parachute um maybe consider not taking the project if you're not ready for it um you know hindsight being 2020 uh probably would have um not taken the project uh this, you know, it's kind of another one of those situations where I kind of jumped in with um, both feet thinking, um, you know, this is going to be great. It's a decent amount of money. I don't have to worry about, you know, projects for a little while and um, kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of where, um, you know, this is kind of where I got a little bit into the weeds with this project and and where I would definitely have uh, <laughs> um, it's going to be a red flag next time uh, similar situation crosses my desk. So um, yeah, so <clears throat> according to our agenda that I kind of outlined roughly up front is um, the last thing is why start your own thing. Um, so <clears throat> there's lots of pros and cons of um, of working for yourself, right? The pros of working um, for somebody else, or um, you know, or cons of of working for yourself, or um, pros of working for somebody else is when you have a kind of a regular full time job, you get a steady paycheck. You don't have to worry about, you know, typically, <laughs> you know. And I think sometimes that's a little bit of a false narrative that we tell ourselves that, you know, if we have a steady day job, we're going to be fine. But, um, you know, the world being as it is these days, uh, nothing is ever certain, I guess. Um, you know, but, you know, but the illusion, say, of a steady paycheck is, is kind of a pro. It's not something that you have to typically worry about on a, you know daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, you don't typically have to sell any of your, uh, you don't have to sell your work or your yourself, basically. <laughs> um, you, there's a lot of times if you're working in a bigger company, there's support from coworkers. So you can, you know, bounce ideas off of um, the person sitting next to you or, or, hey, can, you know, there's fresh, there's always a fresh set of eyes to, to take a look at um, what you're working on and maybe, you know, uh, get a little bit of feedback sort of in real time as, so you, uh, so you don't have to come back later on down the road. Um, <clears throat> another benefit is the employer takes all the risk, right? So employer brings in a project, if they underbid it, um, it's kind of on them. If, um, if they say, you know, we can do your project for, three thousand dollars and and you end up and they end up paying you more than that to actually build the thing um because the thing um you know scoped creeped and and got way out of hand and you know it was a grander client um you're not taking the brunt of that decision um and also there's uh benefits of like 
you know, benefits like insurance and vacation time and sick time and kind of all the the stuff that employers like to to use to lure employees. Um, um, but the pros, I think, <clears throat> for me, anyways, the pros of uh, of my business or starting my own business was um, I, I kind of get to pick my own hours. I get I get to shift my hours around my schedule. I um, you know, actually, um, I live an hour away from where I used to to go work. So I had spent an hour in the car commuting out um, to and from uh, from work every day. So that was two hours a day that I was away from my family. Um, but now, you know, I can schedule my my time around, you know, dropping my kids off at school and picking them up from school. So I get I get to not miss as much being gone. Um, and still have the opportunity to to provide for my family and to to you know work on meaningful fun projects and and all that really fun stuff. Um, uh, another thing is you get there's a lot more autonomy, right? So you know there is some risk in in you know having the autonomy to do whatever you want. Um, you know if you don't you know if you don't sell enough you don't get enough projects in your pipeline you run into issues with cash flow and things like that um um but but you do have the autonomy to um to innovate like to to kind of push a little bit more i think too and 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 you can make the decision whether or not you want to take a little bit of extra time on this project that isn't budgeted um and invest in learning a new a new uh a new a new tech stack or a new way of doing things like if you wanted to you know try making a headless site instead of a regular wordpress site you can you know you can kind of take that risk on on your own and um and innovate and build your own skills and um um and i think that uh um, that part of running your own business is really appealing to me. Um, uh, and there's also the potential to make a lot more money. If you run your own business, you're doing your own thing. You're taking the risks. Um, you know, I think one of the things that was kind of a, um, kind of a, almost, you know, an almost tipping point for me was, uh, you know, during COVID, um, when the COVID thing happened, working at a marketing agency, our clients were freaking out because they were shutting down and retooling and trying to get, um, you know, we had a few restaurant clients. We, um, and so we were like, you know, I was to the point where I was getting up before the sun came up and working till after dinner to make sure I got everything done that, that was being promised to our clients. And, you know, I was, I was killing myself, you know, on a daily basis to, um, to, you know, and I was paid salary, you know, so when I wasn't working those crazy hours, it was a decent salary, but, you know, when you penciled it out with the amount of hours I was working, um, you know, it didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't worth it as much anymore. Um, you know, I was, I was putting in maximum effort and not getting any extra reward other than I get the opportunity to come back and do it again tomorrow. Um, so for me, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to kill myself um, on a daily basis, I might as well do it to make myself rich <laughs> rather than somebody else. You know, maybe that's a little unfair. You know, it was kind of a crisis situation. The, um, you know, I'm sure the, the, the owner of the agency that I worked at, you know, I know that he had a lot of hardship and he was, you know, I'm sure you all remember everybody was closing down. Everybody was canceling jobs. Everybody was canceling projects and, and, or trying to strap on, you know, or trying to bolt on WooCommerce onto their WordPress sites just so they can take online orders to, to stay in business and, um but you know but with no customers there was no money and it was a mess um so 
you know, maybe that was a little bit, maybe I was a little bit hasty and a little, I don't know, but got to the point where I decided that I wanted to, um, to kind of take that risk my, myself and, um, um, and kind of put myself out there and, and see if I could, um, kind of make, um, my own business as successful, you know, or, or stay or be as successful at my own business as being an employee of somebody else's. And I think overall it's been, um, a, um, a really fun, um, challenging <laughs> and, um, uh, but also fulfilling, um, process. See, um, um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back. I think at this point, um, there's something to the autonomy and, um, and the time with my, you know, the autonomy to work around my kid's schedule and, you know, they're not going to be in my house forever. So eventually, you know, uh, you know, I, I want to try to spend as much time as I can with them. Um, and still, um, and still do the work that I like to do and, 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 you know, still pay the bills doing it. So, um, so that was, you know, I kind of, I feel like I kind of jammed through that, but, um, that was kind of all I have. Um, I'm kind of opening up for questions. Um, you know, ask away. If you want to email me, my email address is me at johntrujillo.com. I'm at John Trujillo on most of the socials. So if you want to connect on LinkedIn or I don't really post much on Twitter, but I, um, I kind of lurk a lot on, a lot on Twitter, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so if you want to reach out, those are the places to, to reach out. Um, so yeah. Thank you, John. That's fantastic. Does anybody have any questions for John? I have a question for you, John. Um, yeah. Do you do all of the projects as a sole proprietor or do you have other freelancers that you split larger projects with? Um, so right now I'm, um, I'm uh, doing all the projects except that one that I'm I, I was left holding the bag on <laughs> that one. I was brought in as a, as a developer, you know, as part of a team, but, um, but right now um, I'm kind of doing it all as kind of my own thing, you know, as a solo developer. Um, I think um, as I, you know, grow and take on bigger projects and find um, have that, you know, those opportunities to take on bigger things, I'll definitely need to, to bring on, you know, other, uh, other developers to kind of split some work with. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, I was a freelancer for 20 years, making food look pretty for pictures as a freelance food stylist. So I'm kind of used to the entrepreneurial spirit of things. Yeah. Um, but the computer world and coding and all of that's really new to me. So um, where do things and maybe maybe this is what you're talking about, really like outlining things, but how often the industry are contracts used um, or are things usually just handshake deals? Do you take deposits? Like where oh, yeah. does all of that <laughs> kind of stuff fall in? Yeah, so definitely um, have a contract. <laughs> um, so most is, most clients expect that, right? Or yeah, most clients okay. definitely expect a contract. Okay. Um, and and really, that's the that's the only way to kind of manage those expectations. Like whether the client's a crazy going to be a grander client or not. Right. <laughs> um, like I think the the biggest way that you know. To, to not run into that um, that's separation or that that gap between your expectation and the client's expectation is to have it in black and white in writing right. this is what's being delivered you know sign at the bottom of the, the line it's going to take 
you know, this much time, you know, we're estimating it's going to take, you know, like this schedule to get the project built. Um, it's definitely, um, there's a lot of really good, um, like templates out there for, for how to, you know, put together, um, uh, presentations and, and, or, you know, sales pitches. And then also, um, uh, like estimate bids, right? Because I think a lot of times, um, so there's this really great, um, there's this really great book called, um, uh, uh, it's called Story Brand. Sorry, I like totally blanked on it for a second. So Story <laughs> what is Brand. It? Story, uh, Story Brand? Yeah, Story Brand is really great. And, um, okay. but the guy that wrote that book, um, his name's Donald Miller. He, um, he has this whole, um, sort of marketing made simple um, program that it's not very expensive. It's a couple hundred dollars and it takes you through sort of how to clarify your messaging. And, but also in that is your um, like how to bid out projects and, and to create estimates and, and like your, you know, the, the um the estimate that goes out that your client the contract that your client agrees to is almost like a you know almost like a pitch deck in a sense right. um you know so they agree to the initial you know that that you, you use that framework to sort of outline and get on the same page and communicate communicate clearly what you're going to be delivering you know and then you send them you know an invoice with um you know that's the initial that's the the main agreement and then after they sign that, you send them an invoice with, like I use Wave apps, um, Wave. So when somebody signs an agreement, I'll shoot them a, an invoice with um, with Wave. Wave lets you take a credit card so you don't have to worry about, nice. you know, most <laughs> of the time collecting a check or, you know, dealing with any of that. But um, so for me, typically I take um, uh, a 50% upfront deposit. Um, and then um, sometimes I'll, depending on the project, some, if it's going to be something that takes a lot of time, I'll typically break that the second half into two payments just to kind of get me, get me through. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but sometimes, you know, the second payment is due when the, um, when the design is approved. And then the final payment is due just before launch. So it doesn't go live until I get money, you know, until they, they right. make the final payment. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I guess the other, the other side of that is um, part of the, um, the pitch process and part of building that recurring revenue is um, being able to um, offer hosting, right? So maybe, um, you know, maybe there's an initial, an initial deposit and then you kind of split up the payments into the hosting package, right? So you're, you know, you could, um, it could be an easier sell if you say, you know, it's this initial deposit plus, you know, this much for the rest of, um, you know, the rest of the project split over the first six months of your hosting and then you host it um so if they don't you know follow through with their commitments you don't you're not shipping you're, you didn't already give them every you know turn the keys over to every you know for everything um right. and you have the ability to um you know, no i don't know it's kind of a bummer when if you have to get to the point where you know, you tell a client, sorry, you didn't pay. I have to take your site down or you, or, you know, pay up and I'll zip everything up for you and you can host it somewhere else. Um, right. But, um, but yeah, I think um, uh, to go back to your question, agreements, always a great thing. What I, um, and contracts, but what I throw in as like into mine generally are, um, um, like options, right? So like at the end, it's, you know, there's an optional upsell of a hosting package, you know, pay for the hosting for a year 
and you get it for X amount up front. Um, I've been using, um, I, I do a lot of WordPress or mostly WordPress development. So I just, um, you know, I have affiliate links for, for, for clients that want to kind of manage their own hosting. And so there is no payment, you know, plan sort of situation going on where I can, you know, refer them out and, and get like an affiliate commission on referring somebody to the WP engine or flywheel or things like that. So, um, or, um, I have a digital ocean server that I'm maintaining with a tool called spin up WP. Um, that it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's, um, it's kind of a man. It's almost a managed WordPress hosting setup. It's not exactly what you get for, you know, what you're paying on, um, you know, for if you're if you go with something like WP Engine, um, but it but it allows me to sort of maintain, you know, an inexpensive way for me to manage hosting for clients that, um, you know, that want me to 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 manage their site on a weekly, monthly, you know, annual basis. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a little bit of a rambly answer. No, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John, there's a, there's a question in the chat, but before we get to that question, because related to the hosting, I remember when I was doing freelance stuff, I came to the point where I was like, I am not working with clients, crazy hosting situations anymore. I, I don't know if you've come across that red flag at all, but um, yeah, I just, I just remember that of like, you know, it's like the project's going fine. You're, you're, you're hitting your target number of hours. Then all of a sudden you're at the end and like, you need to put it up on their server and their servers running some old version of Microsoft IIS. And it's, it turns out that they can't remember their password for their, it's like a mass, all of a sudden, like the last little bit is like a massive time suck trying yeah. to, you know, I remember thinking like, if I ever do this again, it's like either, I'm hosting it and I'll handle all of that, or I'll give you the files and send you on your way, but I'm not dealing with people's crazy hosting and not being able to remember their passwords for their domain name and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the DNS, like give me access to your DNS and like, what's DNS? Yeah. What um, is that? Yes. I registered so, my domain with this registrant company in, in Australia. And like, I forgot the password and <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've definitely run into that. Um, I, what I typically do is sort of in my initial conversation, I'll kind of flesh out if there is like a weird hosting situation like that. And if there is, I suggest um, hosting with me on, with my kind of hosting offering or um it's even um, in my agreement that I will um, I will put it I will um, launch their site on one of my preferred hosts, but I'm not going to be dealing with you know a three dollar GoDaddy you know IIS server from yeah. you know nineteen you know ninety nine or something. But right. <laughs> but yeah, so um, you know along with you know managing expectations is like you know, having those conversations with your clients up front um, and and flushing out issues like that sort of from the beginning. So you can have those conversations then instead of, okay, it's time to la launch your site, give me your money um, and your, you know, your credentials for your hosting account. Um, you know, all that stuff, you know, all that stuff happens in sort of the onboarding, um, you know, discovery phase of, of a project. Um, you know, I, I didn't really include, <laughs> obviously it didn't include, you know, much process in this. It was more of a, you know, what not to, or, you know, it was more of a, these are some issues that I wanted to share that, you know, kind of blew up in my face a bit. Um, but yeah, process, you know, one, the one thing that um, will kind of make or break this whole sort of on your own experience is, um, is, is, managing those expectations and having solid um, agreements in place. You know, nobody likes to, 
to have issues where they have to sue somebody or take somebody to court over um you know a website project you know at the end of the day your customer just wants to to get a website online and to to help promote their business and 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 sell their thing whether it's a widget whether it's a service whether it's you know fish tacos <laughs> whether if it's a restaurant you know um they you know nobody wants to have a website just to have a website right it's um it's something that it's an investment that they make um to uh, to further their business and and that's why they pay us thousands of dollars to, to make them for them right right the uh, question in the chat is from kylie and as it's, it's about oh, yeah. how you handle taxes do you sort of build that into your uh, right up front or in into the wave tool or what yeah so um so wave um yeah so the whole financial aspect of of starting your business um definitely um you know <laughs> i'm not a tax professional blah 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 disclaimer injected but um so definitely so wave and quickbooks and all that let you have um you know let you run profit and loss statements and and all the stuff that you need to to file your your schedule c you know tax paperwork and all that stuff um so yeah um and i think one of the biggest the biggest things you should do if you're starting your own business is definitely definitely get a separate bank account <laughs> don't run everything out of your personal bank account because untangling the the bowl of spaghetti that is your personal finances mixed in with business finances um is a nightmare um maybe i should have included that in my uh in my talk too um it's not um it's so much easier to have when you have a separate bank account it's black and white money came in for this money went out for that um if it's you know money came in for this and then you spent money to put gas in your car to take your ki kids to school and you went grocery shopping and you uh, took an end of the summer trip to six flags like none of that stuff's right offable none of it's a business expense um you know it needs to be separate from your business books um so um so yeah definitely have separate bank accounts um using tools like wave or quickbooks or you know accounting software gives you the tools to to run the reports to get the numbers to fill in your taxes i i use TurboTax, um so you know and so i just run reports and say this is how much i spent on these things and you know it's pretty straightforward it's not fun it takes hours and hours of time but um you know but it's pretty you know it's not if you if you have your stuff separated it's a lot easier to manage one thing i would um piggyback onto that i've um i've run my own consulting business for about 13 years and one of the best checks i cut every year is to my accountant he is worth every penny my accountant could call me up tomorrow and say nolan i am doubling my fee and I would still blindly cut him a check without even questioning it. It takes so many of the headaches away when I can just hand him. At first, I, I have an office manager who takes all the receipts and builds up a nice little spreadsheet the way that the accountant wants it. And then I take that spreadsheet from my office manager and I hand it to my accountant and then I'm done. He hands me an idiot proof packet about a month later. It says, sign here, sign here. Here's what you owe the IRS. Here's my fee. And it's the easiest check to cut every year for running my consulting business without, without fail awesome like yeah i think um i'll definitely <laughs> not at the point where i'm hiring an accountant yet but um it's definitely on the radar for sure i have a question yeah actually i have two first uh thanks john for doing this talk um yeah, no problem. But, yeah first off a little dumb question of how did you do the overlay where you're in the little corner on zoom like uh, because i've never seen that Nice. Um, yeah. So let me, let me share this craziness I've got going on. Um, so I'm actually, 
can let me actually share my screen. Um, oh wait, I can't. So um, I'm actually. There you using, go. I had, um, I had to turn. Uh, I had the permission. Uh, no worries. Uh, I can just kind of you're all set now. Yeah, I can explain what I'm doing. Um, so I'm using a software called OBS. Um, it's I think it stands for Open Broadcasting Software. Um, it's a it's a video switching streaming sort of software that um, a lot of gamers use. Some YouTubers use it for stuff. Um, I've used it for some church things, um, but uh, so it's basically a video switcher, and I'm running a second monitor that is, um, you know, OBS is is bringing that in as an input. And then I can kind of switch between like the main camera and and my presentation software. And then um, I don't know if I'm moving around, but like I can move my little um, my little video around and stuff. Um, and my presentation I'm running um, I put I put it together in Canva, so I can um, kind of thumb through in another uh, browser window in my, in Canva. Um, my uh, kind of uh, my presentation. So okay, awesome. And, and my question on your more related to the business was on any tips on marketing of what did or didn't work and on how you got clients specifically. Yeah. So um, so for me, the biggest things that have worked for me are definitely word of mouth. Um, I I haven't had. <laughs> I haven't prioritized marketing a lot, um, you know, hence some of the stumbling blocks I've run into, but um, uh, so one, most of my projects are all um, word of mouth, um, kind of through networking connections, you know, working out of, um, so I'm actually working out of a co-working space tonight. Um, so kind of bumping into people here that have opportunities, um, going to you know different events and meeting people and you know getting to know them and and you know a, a lot of times i don't know if it's different down in sacramento but um i'm i'm actually up in marysville it's about an an hour north of sacramento um so you know bumping into people at networking events in town you know Oh, what do you do? I build websites. Um, oh, let me get your card. There, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of um, people out there that need help with a website. You know, there's definitely a lot of junk leads and a lot of people that don't have um, any clue what it, it'll take to to actually get their business online. Um, but for me, like right now, I'm you know kind of in the stage where I'm um, you know getting projects from either people that I've worked with in the past. Um, I uh, actually, right when I started my business, um, or right when I left the other, um, uh, the other agency that I worked at, I had worked, um, I, I'd actually applied um, for a, a, a company called 10up. It's a kind of a bigger um, WordPress agency. It's one of the, one of the bigger WordPress agencies. And um, and I just asked if they had any, you know, project work that I could, you know, join and like kind of, you know, see if they would, you know, let me work on some projects with them. And actually, so I actually did like a kind of a three month little project with, uh, you know, like little retainer with them, like 20 hours a week. Um, it, it went really well or, you know, it went pretty well. Uh, they decided not to renew the retainer, but um they move super fast and, you know, yeah, but it was, um, but it was really good. Uh, I, I actually learned a lot. Um, but that project was just, you know, reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, um, you know, in this group or other, you know, groups around Sacramento that, um, that are looking for, for people to come in and help. Um, and so just being available, I think is, um, one of the things that's, um, been good for me. Um, that being said, uh, what I'm, um, starting to do is, um, 
Um, I'm actually working on um, developing some video content and some um, like some presentations, not too dissimilar from this to post on LinkedIn to post on, um, uh, you know, a, a Facebook, I, I created a Facebook page for my business. Um, so I'm going to start utilizing those, those um, avenues a little bit more and post, by, you know, by posting relevant content um, and developing, you know, I have some, some programs and stuff that I'm going to be developing and pushing out that, um, you know, will hopefully turn or turn into sort of a productized, um, uh, you know, offering that I can, um, you know, sell and kind of get recurring revenue and stuff like that. So, um, that being said, that's up in the air. So, you know, maybe next month I'll check back in and <laughs> let you know how that's all going. Please do join the meeting next month and let us know what's going on. Awesome. Are there any other questions for John? Um, one, uh, one thing that you reminded me of when you were talking, John, that I would, um, and some of the questions that came up kind of reminded me of it too, is this, there was a really good book when I started, uh, when I started my consulting business that I always recommend to folks that ask some of the questions that people were asking earlier here. And that's, um, a book called the business side of creativity. It's all about like starting your own freelance business. And the, uh, the content is meant for people doing print work and graphic design, making brochures and posters and stuff. But I found that if you just mentally swap out anywhere it says poster and plug in the word website, all of the content still pretty much works exactly the same way. It tells you like all about taxes and dealing with clients and contracts, how much you should charge when you do time and materials versus when you do um, half the payment up front and half at the end and all that kind of thing. It was a really, really good book to kind of get a lot of the imposter syndrome panic out of my way <laughs> when I started my consulting business. That was a, that was a big help. So um, yeah, if anyone on the, um, if anyone in here is looking for a book to read, uh, the business side of creativity is one that I recommend that to everyone looking to go the freelance route. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, one of the, um, one of the, my goals for my business um, is to kind of shift away from, um, and one of the things that I've, I've tried to do is not say, to, to my clients and prospects that this project's going to take this many hours um, and try to, you know, I want to kind of present myself in a way where it's, it's not an hourly based thing and try to make it more value based kind of internally um, on my end. I do base things on hours, <laughs> you know, at least for right now, because I need to make sure that I'm bringing in enough for the project to kind of like account for all of my expenses. Eventually, you know, I think I'll probably, you know, the plan is to get to a point where those um, projects are a lot more, um, uh, you know, separate from, you know, trading an hour for a dollar or a hundred dollars or whatever the hourly rate is. And more, you know, this, website is going to be worth, you know, hundred thousand dollars to this client. So I'm going to charge them 30 because it'll make it worth it for them. Um, not quite there yet, but that's kind of the goal posts that I'm kind of shooting for. Um, you know, I think, um, one of the, the biggest things I wanted to do was not kind of fall into that hourly, um, kind of model because, um, you know, hours are a finite resource, right? I only have so many hours in my day. And um, um, when I trade hours for, you know, trade time minutes for dollars, um, a lot of times it doesn't really work out. Um, you know, the, some of the projects that I kind of ran into issues with, like, um, you know, it was a, a retainer for this many hours for this much money. Um, and it was just straight time for dollars um, transactions. And um, uh, yeah, so 
my plan is to kind of stop doing that for the most part, you know, maybe, you know, there's going to be some phasing of that out, but, um, but that's kind of the goal. Um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions from anyone? I think you knocked, uh, knocked everyone's questions out of the way, sir. Thank you very much for presenting nice. tonight. I appreciate it. Awesome. And thanks everyone for joining, especially all the people that are new this month. Uh, we'll be back here same time next month, third Wednesday of the month, 6.30 p.m. I don't know what the speaker is going to be or what the topic is going to be off the top of my head, but we'll post about it on sacinteractive.com and Twitter and Facebook and all the usual places as soon as that's up and running.